Okay, that, that was a great morning session and a great background and introduction to a fantastic project. So um, looking forward to getting into the question and answer session and a bit of discussion. Um, so we've got our mics. Looks like we've got a question up the back. Jono. Yeah, Jonathan Sanders. Um, I guess this question's probably for Martin and Paul, but uh, Teen and Aslan might have an, uh, an interest in it too. One of the things when we talk about the Cumberland Plain or we talk about other remnant systems like the box woodlands on the western slopes of New South Wales is how few remnants there are and the fact that most of our conservation um, efforts have concentrated on things like trees and plants that are particularly spectacular or well known, you know, that were identified as um, endangered species and so on. Um, if we're actually starting to talk about having the total diversity of, bio, of, say, ground cover species conserved, then what sort of audit do we have about how many of those ground cover species still exist in remnant populations? You know, how many of those species still have more than two or three populations in Western Sydney, for example, and how are we going to address that in terms of making sure those populations are still there to collect seed and have that diversity? Thanks, John. I was involved with um, my, my colleague Sam Craigie um, up there and, and Jane and Tegan uh, and indeed yourself um, looking at a rest restoration project of Cumberland Plain uh, grassy woodland really focusing on the ground layer and I would say we spent four years um, driving around Western Sydney trying to identify uh, local uh, populations. Now we had the uh, the input of people like John O from uh, from national parks and uh, community groups. So we had a lot of original uh, knowledge up front, but even that still required season after season uh, ground truthing to find where sites were, what condition they were in, what quality they were in. So we were making assessments of those sites to try and build up a. Uh, a, a picture of a, of a, a, a reference site, a composite rest, a reference site. And that's really what the only way we could sort of then base our, our sort of our restoration project on that. Um, there was no single site that was representative of all the sites. Uh, you know, they're all in varying degrees of, um, of uh, degradation, even the best sites. And so what we then tried to do is to pull together a composite. In Victoria at the moment, they have a, um, a program called a biodiversity atlas where it is possible to actually, in whatever region you're in, to put a polygon around uh, a, a reserve or a park or even a, you know, a, a roadside. And it will generate a species list of both plants and animals. And that is quite amazing. Um, so that enables you to build up uh, a, a reference population that has been surveyed at some point at that site and it will tell you when the survey occurred. So it was you know, last found two weeks ago or ten years ago. And they're the way that you can then build up that composite picture. Um, I, I don't think that we've got the same thing here and we've had to do a lot more groundwork. Now the cost of doing that groundwork I imagine is quite extensive. But again, the Victorians somehow have managed to do that. Um, if you get a chance, have a look at it, the v v Victorian Biodiversity Atlas. Um, yeah. we, we do have the Biodet um, database as well. And of course, all of the um, seed licensing feeds into, or the reporting on licensing feeds into the Biodet database. So that's certainly one way to capture uh, some of the plant distribution statewide. Yeah, I was just going to say, there was a discussion this morning um, on the succession planning that unfortunately a lot of the knowledge of where things are are held by the amateur collectors um, or people out in the field who are professional collectors. They know where things are. They don't necessarily want anyone else to know where things are. But I, I've been involved for many, many years in doing... Uh, with other hats on roadside because because a lot of the plants have come from roadsides and that, that was my realisation very early in the piece. If I wanted to capture these plants, many of them were on roadsides and producing maps at local government scale of surveys of the areas that exist on 
on council roads, mapping those, documenting all the species, so that in the future, people can go back and locate things from roadsides to start seed production areas. And that in, in the Riverina is where all the uh, seed collection data came from to set up the spars. What was the range of the species? How extensive were they? Where are the best populations? Uh, and what are the standard uh, sort of reference sites? Uh, and I think that is something, and the same goes for, for TSRs in New South Wales. I think it's a huge opportunity to resource and fund uh, that, that level of knowledge and capturing the knowledge of collectors at, at regional NRM scale, but also at state scale, so that we know, because it's not that the knowledge isn't there, it's just not been um, collated in a way that's, that's useful. Uh, and it's, it's not insurmountable to get out all that knowledge together. And I think it's, it really is, needs to be one of the fundamental things is having vegetation guides at a regional level with these reference sites and the, the, the databases of where things are. Is that something okay. for the whiteboard? How do you make that operation? Yep. Okay, that's great. We might move on to the next question. Um, Hi, Paul Adam. Um, it's interesting to remember that both Eastern Suburbs Banks of Scrub and Cumberland Plain Woodland were the first of the endangered ecological communities established in New South Wales more than 20 years ago um, and how little progress we've made since and I actually wrote the determinations for both of them so uh, I've got a long history but in terms of Eastern Suburbs Banks of Scrub with a very limited distribution it is important to remember that it grows in a very specific habitat with very specific soil conditions um, which are difficult to replicate even beyond its boundaries because of all the changes that have occurred in the environment. Uh, but very few of the species in Eastern Suburbs Banksy Scrub are restricted to Eastern Suburbs Banksy Scrub. But we don't know whether there are specific genotypes which are adapted to the extremely low levels of phosphorus. And the Banksia, which gives its name to the community, is Banksia emula, the Wallum Banksia, uh, which of course is common in northern New South Wales and southern Queensland, um, and then there's this isolated population. Uh, I would be alarmed if people take the view of broad genetic provenance, uh, that if they started using, without testing, how different they were, Wallum Banksias from the real Wallum uh, in any restoration, reconstruction in Eastern Suburbs Banksia scrub. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a really important point and um, the debates in the past have been about um, balancing uh, integrity and diversity and uh, in many geneticists say that we are at a higher risk of uh, inbreeding depression rather than outbreeding depression but there are some cases where uh, structure uh, or uniqueness of a particular population can out way that general principle and this is why we need to take what Paul has said on board um, but even if there is um, a, a unique say genotype in the Sydney area um, you would want a broad representation of the genes of that genotype wouldn't you in order to be able to yep so we need to keep those principles in mind and we also need to ensure that we get some genetic research into these species because we do need this information and um, the uh, Botanic Gardens is doing research. I don't know if Banksy Remula is on the list, but um, it'd be great to see some results of that research. But it also, the, the importance of the documentation of where the seed has come from yeah. is essential. Sounds like a good project for Restore and Renew. <laughs> I'll talk to my colleagues. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we get any more questions? Uh, we've got one up the back there. Thanks. Uh, hi, I have a comment for Paul and then a question for Aslan. But um, Paul, there is a, a way to um, query uh, a lot of systematic uh, vegetation surveys that have been done, especially around Sydney um, on Atlas Bionet. It's not the most intuitive process in the world, but it is possible to do. 
uh, to get sort of cover and abundance estimates that have been done for you know your typical 20 by 20 plots. Uh, I actually have a webinar that explains that pretty comprehensively, so I can send that to the uh, to the hosts, and maybe that can be distributed if that's a, a tool that would be useful. I use it a lot to figure out what's growing where. Um, Aslan, I just wanted to ask how you thought the reference VI score for the PCT type that you were using for your uh, for your study sort of matched in terms of a benchmark that was uh, based in reality. Was it was it possible to sort of get to the richness that the benchmark had for each um, each different attribute, or did you find that it was quite quite high? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. And as mentioned earlier, like a lot of these uh, uh, reference site of Cumberland Plain woodland in the Cumberland Plain are, are in various states of degradation and probably there aren't any perfect pristine sites there. And uh, so part of the issue was, you know, when we had these experts in the room debating on what is the actual reference value for richness and cover for these, uh, that, that should actually be the reference site to aim for. And there was even quite a lot of uh, discussion and debate around that as well. So I, I guess the short answer is there isn't a clear cut answer of we have a completely clear idealised version of what the reference is and, and if it could, could reach that, um, there's some fuzziness in that. Could I just make a comment yeah. then, just based on, because I was very interested in the, uh, the, uh, the expert sort of um, projections around that sort of stuff. I, I know of um, a site that are uh, four sites that were assessed. So these are restoration sites that Cumberland playing grassy woodland. Um, they're all less than five years old. Uh, they were assessed under the, uh, the metric, uh, the BAM metric, uh, independently assessed by uh, uh, an accredited assessor. These four um, had all met and actually exceeded the benchmark uh, for that community. Um, and that was within five years. Now, some of those sites had existing trees within them and so they were enhancing around that. So you got the value of the trees, you got values of logs as well. Um, but they certainly uh, made it for the diversity and the function. Um, and in Victoria, we've had sites, um, grassland and grassy woodland sites assessed under the uh, Victorian habitat hectare uh, metric. And these, again, have... Um, uh, you know, gone close to or met the benchmark um, and in, in that case have been actually listed on the state's register of significant um, grasslands and these were all less than 10 years in age. So just putting out there that obviously that was a, uh, an important process to go to the experts and get their assessment on what might be possible but we are starting to get sites coming online now that are actually real life examples and not all sites will meet that, uh, will make that and many sites that I've been associated with wouldn't come near that. But there are sites that have and I guess they're the key for us. Where do we know that it's worked and we've exceeded these benchmarks? What are the conditions that have gone into making those sites work so well in, in that time frame? And how can we set up systems and structures that we can begin to replicate that process more effectively? And I guess that was to some extent uh, reflected in the experts where you would see some actually went above reference values as well, but there was a huge variation, as I mentioned, between and within the experts, which is, I guess, capturing that some sites would never do that, some sites would do it easily, and part of our challenge was to come up with some generic rules we could model across the whole Cumberland Plain, which means we needed to capture that heterogeneity to some degree, but, yeah, I agree with everything you're saying. Yep, and... Um what concerns me is that there is there is the natural heterogeneity that um, creates some uncertainty, but there's also the practitioner heterogeneity. Uh, so it's very important to hear what you're saying about um, extracting guidelines for best practice, um, because it's all very well to say that restoration can do this uh, and to then count that in the offset planning, but will restoration do this? Is the, uh, are the contractors actually capable of doing this? Have their set standards of practice um, been demonstrated in the past? So this is where ARBA comes in and where um, we have a, a, an accreditation system for bush regenerators, but we don't have one 
for people who are reconstructing ecosystems and it'd be very interesting to collaborate with other organisations to work towards that. Great. Thanks, team. Uh, any more questions? Oh, we've got one from Tim Berryman. Oh, no. We'll, we'll take one down the front here first. Yeah. Yeah. Hi there, Victoria Lugavoy. Um, I had a question following on from Jono and stuff that you were talking about, Martin. I don't know if it relates to what is already in, pra in practice. Um, but how, do we, how are we able to keep track of where all um, at different groups, so different nurseries and seed collectors um, that they're gathering seed from, how are we able to determine that this, the, the amount that they are taking, if it's still less than 10%, are we able to keep track of that and make a database and then make sure other collectors are then not going to that same place taking the seed and then seed will slowly degrade um, and obviously we lose that viability within certain sites. Is that something that's... Um, that Healthy Seeds is, or is that something to think about? Look, it, it is an issue, um, and it's a potential issue, and it becomes more of an issue, you know, we, we say that, you know, funding is one of, the, one of the critical things. One of the big risks is if you turn up the funding, it creates a greater demand, which puts pressure on, and even collectors that I've spoken to recently have said, oh, look, we're doing the right thing, and I said, yeah, but how do you know that someone behind you is not doing the right thing? Um, look, it is an issue, and I think it's one of the things that we need to discuss how you get the level of coordination that's needed, where there is some central body that you're saying, we know these, these areas are going to be in demand or these wild populations are going to be in demand, and that there are mechanisms for distributing seed either centrally coordinated or allowing you know, multiple bodies, groups to have a certain amount of seed or ultimately for some of those species you know there's going to be demand making sure that there's seed production areas put in place where the genetic issues are captured you know, and, and that c it can be dealt with that way. You'll never absolutely stop it I don't think but I think we need to have a look at what the best uh, mechanisms of achieving uh, minimum conflict and allowing uh, you know, self-sustaining systems in the wild. Because you know, I've, I've seen it, I've seen the over-harvesting that goes on, um, uh, and it's, it's, it can be dealt with, I think, at, at a NRM regional level if the systems are put in place. Sorry, I'll hmm? touch on that. You saw on the survey that most of our seed is coming from, you know, the roadsides and the private property. So, again, we're skewing towards those small uh, populations that can't really afford to be over-harvested. And the larger potential sites are, again, poten more often than not off-access, um, particularly in areas in the large parts of New South Wales where you're dealing with threatened communities. So even for species that might be quite common, uh, in, within a threatened community in large parts of uh, you know, the countryside are not accessible through the permitting system even. Um, but just a point on the uh, tracking of the seed. In America, they, they've got some great systems over there around seed certification um, and, and seed source programs. So, again, they've got a market there that will support all that sort of um, standardisation and structure, whereas we have very little standardisation, very little structure, and pretty much everyone's out there just trying to do the best they can. Most of the time, I think people have goodwill and best intent. We're all out there trying to collect seed to restore vegetation and stop it all disappearing. But there is no structure to that, and often that ends up poorly. OK, yep, Sustain sustainability of wild harvesting, definitely a big issue for the, for the project. Um, I think the other side of the equation, you can focus on a little bit on that point, Paul, is um, what you do with the seed. You know, we're talking about net gain and um, benefit for the plant communities. It's not just how you manage the seed source and the remnants and the quality of them, but what you do with it. So species selection, ground preparation, habitat matching, good choices in the recipient sites you can potentially waste a lot of seed or you can potentially have a significant net gain. So it's, you sort of look at regulation 
the bigger picture, I think, is backing ourselves that we're good practitioners and we do good things and we're going to get a net gain if we utilise C. But that assumption that we're good practitioners probably needs to be tested a little bit too. I, I feel that if we've got the C resource and it's freed up to let us do work, we'll probably do good work. If we probably do good work, we'll probably get a net gain. But um, we can talk about that more later. I, I, I yeah. had a, some notes on all of you, but just sort of restrict them to uh, one comment. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, I was just curious from your pickup number, but uh, <laughs> um, you get a call. Well, you, you had two, You've heard of me uh, too, haven't you? <laughs> you had two middle categories of vegetation. Um, my, my comment is, I don't believe they're equal. Um, so, uh, an intact understory requiring some upper strata might require 300 grams of eucalypts, three or four or five kilos of mixed shrubs, an offset aerator pattern through it, over sowing, walk away, and you could get a really good result with a limited amount of seed and one procedure. Um, a thick canopy requires teams of people with chainsaws, thorough ground preparation, hundreds of kilos of seed, on species that are hard to get and particularly hard to get from a provenance point of view. So they're quite different scenarios. They're not, they're not equal. No, and, and I think you've, you've raised a whole range of points and I think some of them will come back to and visit again this afternoon. But it, it's also, uh, you know, I think there is huge scope for the science of improving the German ability particularly with direct seeding for a range of species so that they're more wisely used and getting better results and less seed is going to be used overall. But again, it comes back to if you've got successful sites and good documentation of where the seed has come from, those future sites also become future collection sites as well. So for every good, well done site that's tracked, you're actually increasing the amount of seed that's going to be available for restoration. Which makes it important to um, utilise remnants because if it's project on project on project, the project sites become very inbred and very uniform because seed production areas have natural selection process to be at a certain harvest height or a certain production regime or certain irrigation system. So you get sort of uniformity in the production areas and then you're getting collection on collection on the recipient sites as well. So that original source being from diverse genetics and out of the landscape, out of remnant landscape, becomes even more important. Yeah, hope, hopefully you're not. Uh, there is inherent selection going on all the time. A lot of it's unintended. And they're the sorts of things hopefully you are, can manage for in seed production areas. So you, you're not necessarily selecting for harvest traits, although in the States that's not necessarily the case. Uh, but I think in Australia that, that discussion is aiming for diversity. And I'll just quickly respond to your previous comment about the medium sites. I, I completely agree with you and maybe it wasn't quite clear that those two medium sites, the intention was not to say that they were both equal. We sort of have the two extremes of low and high and then these two intermediate sites, but completely agree that having the intact ground story makes it much easier than uh, the case where that's highly degraded. And of course, we didn't factor anything in around the actual costs and effort of restoration either in the uh, elicitation, but more just what was possible if management was going to occur. But yeah, I, I take your point. I was just going to say, um Maybe Tim might have swapped them round if they were on a spectrum. Yep. That's it. Okay. Um, we're get running up to morning tea. Before we do, um, just a very quick plug. Uh, even Australia Post are getting behind seed banking at the moment. Um, today we've actually got a seed banking stamp has been released uh, for all you post office uh, folk. Um, but, yeah, it, it celebrates the work of the Australian Seed Bank Partnership, which is our conservation... Um, network of seed banks right across Australia. So it celebrates the fantastic work that, uh, that we're doing. Uh, so come and have a look uh, at the front here uh, for some of the, uh, the graphics around the stamp collection.